Welcome everybody to another exciting interview. Today with us, we have Dr. KC Rondello, who serves as a clinical associate professor of public health and emergency management at Adelphi University in Garden City, New York. This is the third time Casey's been joining us. So if you haven't been following along, I just wanna go through his bio really quick so you can kinda of get to know who he is. But we've done an interview in uh, May, June, and this is our July interview. So we've been following coronavirus as it's been happening. So just a little bit about Casey. For almost two decades, Dr. Rondello has served as a disaster epidemiologist with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Disaster Medical System. Assigned to the multi-specialty enhancement team, he has been deployed to the organization to critical emergency medical and public health support to regions of the country overwhelmed by disaster. In this capacity, Dr. Rondello collaborated with the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, the Newark branch, in developing an international isolation contingency plan in response to H1N1 in 2009. Other notable deployments have included dispatch to terror attacks in the World Trade Center in 2001, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Gustav, Hannah, Ike, um, Hurricane Sandy, gr the Great Tennessee Flood, and Hurricane Maria. Um, Dr. Rondello's scholarly research focuses on the application of disaster epidemiology to epidemic and pandemic planning and response to the establishment and management of alternate medical treatment sites and pharmaceutical points of distribution. He provides consultation services to both government and non-government organizations wishing to become resilient against all ha hazards that threaten mission critical continuity of operations. He was educated at Yale University School of Medicine in the U.S. and St. George's Medical School in the United Kingdom. So welcome, Casey. Welcome back, I should say. Uh, thanks. I'm so glad to come back, and I appreciate having the forum to share uh, with you this very fluid and dynamic situation that we're all sort of confronting uh, as it's happening in real time. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about today is... I want to get to the big hot topic in coronavirus right now because I feel like it comes and goes like sometimes it's like all in the news all we're talking about and then sometimes it like wanes a little bit right now the big hot topic for everybody because it's coming up in for my kids in like two weeks is schools so yeah. <laughs> should we be sending our kids to schools and does it depend if cases are rising and falling what are your thoughts on this k-12 to and college system that's coming very quickly yeah I, I've, I've spoken to many parents uh who are frustrated and anxious and all of that is uh you know, completely understandable given the circumstances we're in a situation in which we're being asked to make decisions with incomplete information. And, and there are so many unknowns that it's nearly impossible to be able to, to, to make an educated, informed decision about something as important as, do I send my kid to school? Yeah. When, when we really don't know what the situation is gonna look like uh, a month from now. The, the, there have been many organizations that have weighed in on the pros and the cons, ranging from educator organizations to the American Academy of Pediatrics. And you know, ultimately, it comes down to the balance of the benefits that are to be gained with in-school instruction uh, versus the risks. And for different families they, and in different areas of the country, uh, they will strike that balance in, in different ways. I can tell you that um, uh, there is this preconceived notion, I'm not sure how it all began, but that children are somehow immune to negative effects of the COVID-19 yes. uh, disease. That's not at all true. Children get COVID-19, children die of COVID-19, and furthermore, uh, children that become sick, um, you know, endanger those that are around them, whether they be from their families or, or, or otherwise. So uh, certainly do ne never should I, would I recommend that a parent have this uh, impression that children are safe and children are fine because ultimately that's not at all the case. Um, I'm not sure if that's an, a, an education issue that we have to get people to understand that. But uh, while it is true that when we look at those with the most significant symptoms on the age spectrum, children tend to have the lowest, among yeah, the lowest, yeah. 
of, of bad symptoms, um, but by no means is a zero. And like I said, ch some children get very sick and in fact succumb to the illness. So there's not this, uh, I wish there was, but there's not this magic halo of protection. Sure. So if we are going to send our kids back, so right now, like my situation, we have a choice. We can do this hybrid model. We can do online. If we do send our kids back, what are some of the big things that schools should be doing or me as a parent should know? Like, is there a red flag where I should say, okay, I should not be sending my kids to this school? Or is there is there something that the school should definitely be doing that should be like maybe wearing, having the kids wear masks or something? Are there certain big issues that I should be looking out for? Yeah, there are so many answers to the, to the questions that you've posed. I'm trying to keep them all straight in my head. But I want to actually back up to something you started off by saying, and then I promise we'll get to your question. Um, the question You said that you have the option of electing for an in-person uh, experience for your child or a virtual experience mm -hmm. for your child. It just made me think about a conversation that I had with a parent last week, um, and she was struggling with, with how to handle that exact same situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I just want to speak to that, if I may. So I think that when, it, if you are put into a position as a parent where you're given options to choose from for your child, whether it be, you know, fully online, fully distanced, some sort of hybrid model in between, one way to consider the options is to think about what the worst case scenario would be in those situations. So let's say, for instance, we'll simplify things. And let's say that a parent has to choose between, I either commit to having my child in school full time, or I commit to having my child in the virtual environment. In the virtual environment, if you, may, if you go that route, what's the worst that can happen? Let's say that uh, against all evidence, every scientist on the planet was wrong and COVID in a month's time completely somehow vanishes from something we no one ever saw coming. Uh, what's the worst outcome from that? The worst outcome would be that your child is learning at home and has limited interaction with other children of, of their age that they would have if they went into the classroom mm -hmm. environment, okay? And then eventually they, they go back to school and everything is status quo. That'd be, the, that'd be sort of the worst case scenario. Let's flip, to the, let's flip the coin. Let's say that you commit to having your child in the in-person environment. What's the worst case scenario there? Worst case scenario, let's say, is that things get even worse than we are predicting. And I'm telling you, they, we're predicting that in the fall, they're going to be significantly worse than they are now. So let's say it's even beyond that. Now you're in a situation where the school is, by virtue of all the people coming together every day, an unsafe environment, and you have committed to sending your child every single day into that, you know, into that uh, uh, possibility, into the possibility of them being infected, them being exposed. Um, and if you weigh those two worst case scenario uh, options, um, that can help in, in helping you make a decision with incomplete information, right? So it's just one perspective of how to think through that very difficult uh, decision. Yeah. In answer to your, the other part of your question, which is what should we be looking for in schools? I'll tell you that the CDC has created some extremely valuable guidance for those involved in K through 12 yeah, education. Yeah. And it includes many, many different recommendations that as you mentioned, uh, part of them are, are, that are involved, mandatory mask wearing, AM, PM schedules or some other, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday versus Tuesday, Thursday schedule where there's limited number of individuals in the classroom, social distancing, increased um, um, uh, cleaning protocols with hospital grade disinfection. Uh, there are many different steps that a school can take to create as safe an environment as possible. If I were a parent, I mean, this stuff is publicly available. Sure. If I were a parent, I'd look to the CDC's guidance. I'd look to the state that I live in's Department of Health guidance for schools. And then I'd turn to those that are the administrators and staff of the school where my child's going to go and hold them to account for what are you doing about this? What are you doing about this? 
These are what are universally accepted as best practices by experts. You know, uh, uh, how are you implementing those best practices? If, if you can't get an administrator to give you a straight answer to that question, that's the biggest red flag of all. Because it's not a mystery how to make a school safest in the COVID-19 pandemic, right? We know they can't be completely disease-free, sure. risk-free zones, but we're far enough along in this pandemic that we know how best to create an environment that mitigates the spread of the disease. That stuff is, it, 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 that's not a mystery. So if you have a school that's for one reason or another, whether it be you know financial or otherwise, chosen not to implement those protections, it, if I were a parent, it would cause me to seriously question whether they take safety of my child as seriously as I do. And that, and that would be a point of great concern for me. Yeah, I know a lot of teachers and students are concerned. Teachers are concerned that they're scared to go back in the classroom because they're they're unsure themselves that this can happen or that parents will take it seriously. And it's it's just, you know, this big like circle of what's going to happen, what's going to happen. No one has training, no one has money. You know, it's it's very scary right. time for parents and teachers, you know. We've been we've almost been questioning whether the hybrid model is actually worse because parents who work maybe will have no choice but to send their kids to daycare during you know and just somewhere else instead of being at school altogether now the kids ex are being exposed everywhere altogether we're scared like schools will become the next cruise ships i mean that's what that's what me and my wife are are nervous about and trying to make our decision what we're going to do yeah you uh one point that you make that's that i, I just want to hit again because uh, uh it reminded me of a conversation i had with a recently uh admitted freshman to college and he was talking about, he was asking me for my advice about what I thought he should do in terms of, you know, do I go, do I not go? You, you can't really make that decision until you know what the alternatives are, right? And then you weigh yes. those options. Saying, say, making a decision about, you know, going full-time on ground, full-time in person or a hybrid model. Um, if, you're, if, the, if the choices are between I go online or something else, happens, you know, you really can't make an educated decision about that. You need to have, you know, it's spelled out, well, what am I weighing between? And you're right. If the option is, uh, you know, going to a, a daycare center, that may be a higher risk environment and certainly should help to inform your decision making. Always evaluate, well, if it's not A, what is B and what is C and what is the relative risk there? So are we any closer to a vaccine or treatment for this? And when should we expect a vaccine? I, I've been seeing some good news. Like I think just yesterday we saw like Oxford, they had good, some yep. success in their vaccine. Like where are we in this? Yeah, that's, and I, uh, of course I saw the same things and I'm, I'm greatly encouraged by those advances. Um, ultimately that th that's really good news, but it doesn't meaningfully change the timeline of when a vaccine okay. will become available. I'll tell you that, uh, and I may have mentioned this in one of our earlier interviews, the fastest that we have ever developed a vaccine for an emerging infection in history, okay, from the time the pathogen's been identified until the time the vaccine is going into people's arms has been four years. Wow. And that's not because we wanted it to be that slow. It's not because we didn't have great technology. It's not because we didn't have a, a desire to conquer measles. Of course we did. And I'm using measles as an example. But it's, it, it's not that we did. It's just that's how long it takes to go through the rigor of the necessary checks and balances, uh, 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 verify that a vaccine is safe and effective, that it's not going to pose more risk than the disease it would, and that it's going to ultimately be effective. Because of the uh, accelerated timeline for COVID-19 vaccine development, we're looking at shortening that time span to 18 months, which really is a Herculean effort on the part of scientists globally with billions upon billions of dollars spent and thousands upon thousands of research scientists working collectively toward this goal. So, it's my expectation that a vaccine will be available for COVID-19 um, sooner than we ever would have seen in another disease. 
That's the good news, okay? The bad news is you may have also seen recently in the media that there is uh, mounting evidence that immunity to COVID-19, once you've been exposed, may not be long lasting. Yeah. There are more and more cases in the literature where people have gotten reinfected with COVID-19 after a period of only two, two and a half months from their first case. Now, again, these are anecdotal reports and by themselves really have very little sure. meaning. However, it does pose a serious concern because there's great implications for vaccine development if people's immunity wanes so quickly. So it's just another example of how, as an emerging situation, we don't have all the answers. In terms of a vaccine timeline, the best case that I can see is that a vaccine becomes available in, you know, the 18 month time window, which would be in the early part of 2021. And that's not, and also don't, don't think that the vaccine is gonna make everything fine. It won't, it won't. It's gonna be a critical tool and it's gonna be a big help but it is just another public health intervention along with all the other interventions that we will continue to utilize until we get on top of this pandemic. Certainly having a vaccine in hand is going to be a, a great uh, additional barrier, but it by itself does not solve the COVID problem, right? It's, it's it along with the social distancing, distancing, the mask wearing, the staying home if you're sick, and on and on and on. All the other protections that we've implemented, they work synergistically along with the vaccine to, to, to essentially get us to the point where COVID-19 is no longer an epidemic as fast as possible. And that has to do with herd immunity, which I know you've asked about before. Yeah, so are we in any closer to this herd immunity? And if it, it's not, we're only immune for it for two to three months, potentially, you know, are we going to get, is it possible to get herd immunity? It's a great question. It's a great question. No one knows the latter part of that question, yeah. right? We're still moving forward with the idea that whether you get immunity through a vaccine, once that eventually gets uh, manufactured, and it will, um, it's just a matter of time. And, uh, or you could also get immunity from having a, a natural exposure and develop antibodies from the exposure of the antigen. Um, the concept of herd, herd immunity is that uh, in order for an entire population to be protected from a disease, a certain percentage of that population needs to have, have had antibody protection in order to essentially buffer the sick people with enough immunized or antibody people in between that the disease cannot be transferred easily from person to person to person. The percentage of how many people have to be immune varies depending on the illness. For some illnesses that are very contagious, uh, you're looking at a herd immunity necessary of like 90%. For other diseases that are less easy to spread, herd immunity of like 40% is sufficient. We estimate that for COVID-19, the necessary herd immunity in order to, uh, that we have to achieve in order for the population to be protected is probably somewhere between 65 and 70%. So on our average figure, 67% herd immunity. Where are we now? Well, in the heaviest hit parts of the country, parts like New York City, mm -hmm. that were the earliest to have a large number of people infected, we are right around 25 to 30% uh, exposure. So we're not even half Jeez. of where we need to be regionally for that to occur, for herd immunity to occur. We will achieve herd immunity at some point through the combination of people being naturally exposed and people be, uh, uh, having an immune response by virtue of being vaccinated. We will eventually reach that percentage. And there's nothing that we can do to not have that happen. COVID-19 will continue to march along at some pace until that magic coverage percentage is achieved, right? What we're trying to do with a vaccine and with other protections is to get that to happen as quickly as possible because between now and then, there'll just be more people sick and more people that, that die that succumb to the illness. Now, I read that uh, this virus isn't really changing too much. I've read maybe it's gotten more contagious or I saw something out of Italy that maybe, you know, it's not getting as, it's not 
as powerful as it once was, but for the most part, it seems like it's pretty steady and hasn't hasn't really changed that much. Is that correct? Is it? Is yeah. It, so all I was going to say, all viruses uh, change with yeah. time, right? Because every time that the virus goes from one person to another, it provides an opportunity for the genetics of the virus to change. Sure. Sometimes those genetics make it easier to spread. Sometimes it makes it less easy to spread. Sometimes they make it more deadly or less deadly. Um, it, it, it completely varies. And the more, the longer that a pathogen is around, the more of these changes occur. It's completely premature to say whether it's getting stronger or getting weaker. Yeah. However, you know, we, we move forward with our vaccination effort and with our treatments under the impression that the SARS-CoV-2 virus fundamentally remains close enough to the same so that immunity coverage to one strain of the virus provides cross coverage to another. Gotcha. Um, that's the assumption we go into this with, and that's what, until it's proven otherwise, we have to, you know, it, it is the working theory. So the way the virus appears to be moving in the country, you know, it, it was in New York and it wasn't where I live in North Carolina. It wasn't in Florida. It wasn't in Texas. It wasn't in South Carolina. It wasn't in Georgia. But now it's here where I live. It's in the South. It's in Texas, Florida, South Carolina, Georgia. It seem like the big hot spots. North Carolina, we're like in between that. We're like, we're, we're moving up in cases. Is this still wave one for us? Or are we on our second wave? Did wave one ever end? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about waves and you should know that yeah the whole concept of a wave is essentially a semantic uh, uh issue sure <laughs> you know the reality is that it's here and i'll tell you in terms of waves you know we imagined as we modeled what would happen with covid that there would be this initial if you will wave of cases that would occur in the spring and that there'd be some sort of respite in the summer where the caseloads would go down before there would be a more definitive uptick, which some people would call a wave two uh, in the fall, right? Um, that is not what happened. And unfortunately, it's not not what happened because the models were wrong. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way because of decisions that were made. We never imagined that governors of states would choose not to follow the prescriptive advice of the CDC, of their health department, um, had uh, different regions of the country all done what was recommended by the CDC and others and kept their businesses closed, economies closed, until they reached those key metrics that indicate that it is safer to open, we would have seen exactly what we predicted, which is a decrease in the cases, not to zero, but to a low amount during the summer, essentially giving all of us in the disaster response world a chance to catch our breath, get our systems in place, restock supply, you know, uh, get ready for the quote unquote fall wave. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. You had many areas of the country knowingly choose to ignore the advice of public health officials. Um, for different reasons, be they economic, political, or otherwise. And as a consequence, we never got the benefit of that dip that we had anticipated for the summer. In other words, all the improvements in getting the way that the uh, case counts in the Northeast that were so high in the spring, all those improvements that got our case counts down, that's where I live, we literally went from worst to first in terms of new cases in two and a half months. COVID would essentially be toward it, petering out to non-existence if every state looked like New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut did. But we, as we know, that's not what happened. And the, the vast explosion of cases in the South and the West in the United States, more than, than made up for the decrease in cases in the Northeast, so that ultimately, if you look at the national trend, we never got that, that decrease. It just ended up, it, the cases just went from one area of the country to another. And sadly, that was completely predictable. It was exactly what anybody uh, uh, worth their salt in public health or epidemiology said would happen. Um, and 
it unfortunately uh, didn't have to be that way. But that's exactly what happened. So now we're in the situation where things were bad in the spring. They continue to be bad in the summer, albeit not as bad as they were at the peak, certainly not as low as we had hoped. And yes, you bring up the point about the fall. Um, it is widely believed by disaster uh, epidemiologists, including myself, that we will see a substantial increase in COVID cases in the fall. This is for a number of reasons. Um, first off, as the temperatures cool, people spend less time outdoors. We know that an outdoor environment is safer than an indoor one. As people come indoors, there's greater chance for transmission. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we know that this particular pathogen flourishes in cold environments. So as the temperature cools in areas of the country, it's easier for the virus to live and to replicate. But perhaps the most damning facet of the fall that's going to be uh, a problem is that it will be occurring at the same time as the onset of influenza. Now, your immune system can only handle so much at one time. And the double assault of being bombarded with COVID-19 and influenza is for many people going to be essentially a line too far to cross and then they, they will ultimately become sick. Um, that is really the nightmare scenario that we're worried about. It's the combination, the double punch of influenza and COVID happening simultaneously, overwhelming the healthcare system, filling our ICUs, which you know, in some areas of the country, it's not flu season and their ICUs are, yeah. are packed. I mean, you know, uh, I forget what the number is because it keeps fluctuating. But you know, uh, you know, at one point last week it was 40, 50 uh, uh, of the hospitals in uh, in Florida ICUs are already maxed out. This is not even with the advent of flu season. So that's why we all put a big question mark in our minds when we when we when we think about the fall. We know it's not going to be the way it is now. We know it's going to be worse. What we don't know is powers, right? Are we going to get to the point where things are as bad as they were for the Northeast in the spring? Don't know. Is it going to be uh, uh, worse than that? You know, even a greater peak than we would have seen in the spring? Don't know. You know, we, we will be able to have a better idea of that as we get closer and closer into September, into October. But that's what the landscape looks like we're headed toward. It seems like in the South right now, we've been doing a good, even though our hospitalizations are up, we've been doing a good job uh, keeping people alive. Are we, have we learned, are we, are we better at that now than we were two months ago that, or oh, than yeah. last month? Like, yeah, certainly. Because you remember, you know, as a novel pathogen, there is, there was so much and still is so much that we don't know about this disease including how to best treat it. So as more and more people become treated for COVID-19, we learn from those experiences. It helps to guide our approach to treatment in future patients. So absolutely, we are better equipped in our knowledge now than we were when this all started in February, that's for sure. And also, you know, you bring up a question about the, the case counts. You know, I know there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about testing leading to more cases. I don't think I need to say this, but I will. Uh, the tests do not create the cases. The cases are there. It's a matter of whether or not we identify them or not. And for those that say, well, you know, we're doing more testing, so we are identifying more cases, uh, we are, and we do. But that does not explain why there are also more hospitalizations. Sure. Because had we do, if we did no testing, if we stop testing, we still have the hospitalization. We still have the hospitalization. Yeah. The hospitalization rate, unfortunately, continues to track up. You know. Uh, also, bear in mind that testing is not going up at the same percentage as cases. And the number changes every day. But uh, week to week, we uh, this was uh, uh, last week or the week before. I forget. But there was a thirty-seven percent increase in the number of case, of tests that we did. So you'd think, okay, well, that would mean that we'd catch 37% more cases. But in fact, in that same span, we increased 37% more cases. We identified something like 125% more 
uh, uh, individuals got sick with COVID. So it's not even that the number of people that have COVID is going up in the same proportion as the increase in the number of tests. So certainly while you do more tests, you do identify more cases, but A, they don't create the cases. B, the increase in cases is happening faster than the increase in number of tests. And C, regardless of how many tests you do, that would have no impact on the individuals that are sick enough to need hospitalization. So it seems like hospitalizations and deaths are probably the two big numbers to pay attention to when you're looking at an increase in an area because, you know, the number of cases can be going up, but hospitalizations are going up no matter what. So someone can't argue that, well, we're testing more. Hospitalizations, no matter what, that's a very important number. Exactly right. Bear in mind as well that those two indicators are late indicators of disease. So if you're looking for, uh, you, if you're looking to monitor hospitalizations or deaths as a measure of how are we doing in my area, sure. that's good. And that's certainly, you know, a, 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 a viable strategy. But bear in mind that hospitalizations and deaths come late yeah, in the yeah. picture, in, in, in the sequence of illness. And so when you start seeing changes in death rates, that ship has sailed. You're right? from cases like six to eight weeks ago, right? Like Precisely right, right? So the incubation period for uh, COVID-19 is probably around four to five days. The incubation period is the period between the point at which you were infected and the point at which you have your first sign or symptom. So essentially you're infected, but you don't know you're infected because you haven't expressed any symptoms that would lead you to believe you're sick, right? That's the incubation period. We use as a working number an incubation period of up to 14 days. So already, if you're talking about using someone has, you know, gotten symptoms as a measure of is this area getting worse, right? Already that exposure can have happened two weeks ago. Yeah. Now from that point, someone gets sick enough to go to their doctor. And that's more time. Then the doctor says, you know, you really should go to the hospital. That's more time. Then you end up in the in the ICU on a vent. That's more time. And God forbid this person succumbs to the illness. That's more time. So you can see how using deaths as an indicator of how we doing is a late, yeah. late indicator. Maybe and two really, months behind. I mean, and that's oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right. So as far as so, I want to move on to masks and talk a little bit about them. Um, okay. Is there anything? Is there anything bad about wearing a mask? Do, do you, can you get, I, I see, I, I, I know these are probably not real, but I just, I wanna talk to you about it anyway. I've seen Facebook posts saying, you can get more sick by wearing a mask because you breathe in more of the virus, you're breathing in carbon dioxide, all kinds of different things. Is there anything harmful about wearing a mask? You know, I'm dumbfounded when I hear things like that because um, it that goes, you know, statements like that uh, uh, are contrary to what over a hundred years of germ theory has told us. You know, it's interesting. I saw a post as well in Facebook and someone said to all those who believe that masks pose a threat, next time you have to have an operation, remember to tell your surgeon to not wear a mask because we wouldn't want them to be sick. And we certainly don't want them to have a low oxygen level while they're operating the scalpel, right? And of course that sounds ludicrous because it is ludicrous. If masks posed a risk, hospitals for over a hundred years would be littered with the dead bodies of doctors and nurses who have been wearing masks since the late 1800s when germ theory was understood, right? There's obviously, I say obviously, but apparently not, there's no scientific basis for masks being a risk. I will tell you masks are, depending on how long you wear them or what masks you're wearing, can be uncomfortable. And I think that a lot of people are so desperate to be in a situation where they don't have to wear a mask that they are, um, you know, creating some kind of pseudoscience of, you know, you're breathing in the carbon dioxide that you're expelling and that, but no, no legitimate scientist, doctor, uh, that I've ever known of or read, and I encourage anyone to find any scientist 
of, of uh, who's reputable who would who would say that. So um, so yeah. So I I I'm dumbfounded that I still have to say this. Uh, I will. There is uh, the the benefits of wearing a mask uh, in the case of preventing COVID are what the science supports. It's what data uh, supports. It's what germ theory has supported uh, for, 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 you know, since, since the 19th century. So, so yeah, so that's the skinny on masks. I know what didn't help people's, and this is understandable, what didn't help people's understanding about where should I wear a mask is the fact that there was conflicting evidence early on sure. in the COVID pandemic, but there were very specific reasons for that. So, for instance, in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there weren't enough masks for healthcare workers. We're all well aware of, especially N95s, of, of the lack of N95 masks being available. Yeah. And we didn't want individuals who weren't in a high risk clinical environment hoarding masks that would otherwise protect healthcare workers. But furthermore, we, the, the other really big uh, uh, point that we didn't really understand well was the importance of the asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, and pausasymptomatic individuals. We now know that one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons, frankly, that COVID-19 has been so difficult to control is because of the contribution of asymptomatic pre-symptomatic and palsy-symptomatic individuals. Initially, we thought that people that fall into those buckets, there were some, but it was a small number, probably around 5%. Then, then evidence began to say, well, it's probably closer to 15, then 25, then 33. And now the CDC believes that it can be more than half of the individuals who have COVID-19 are actively shedding virus and pose a threat to other people, up to half of them fall into one of those buckets. Wow. Pre-symptomatic, meaning that they're in that incubation period. Mm -hmm. So they've been exposed and they're sick, but they haven't had that first sign or symptom. And so they don't know they're sick. That's pre-symptomatic. Asymptomatic, those are the folks that have gotten sick and will never exhibit symptoms, but yet they are still having, they still have active virus, they're still shedding virus, they still pose a risk to others. And posse symptomatic. The posse symptomatic are those who have symptoms, but those symptoms are so mild that they either don't notice them or, you know, they, they write them off to, oh, it's allergies, it's a cold. They never yeah, think okay. to connect the dots and say, oh, it's COVID-19. So when you have up to half the people who have COVID-19 be one of those three categories, the importance of having the pub people when they're outside of their homes wearing masks to cloth masks to prevent them spreading that illness to others cannot be overstated. Once we began to understand how significant the asymptomatic, presymptomatic, and postsymptomatic people were in the spread of this disease, it became critical for individuals to wear masks when they're outside their home because it's those masks. They don't protect the wearer. Their primary purpose is to protect others mm -hmm. from the wearer. And I know we talked about this at length in, in, a, in our pre, one of our previous chats, and so I'm not gonna reiterate it, but I'll say that the wearing of a cloth mask is not primarily intended to protect the wearer. It does afford a little protection for the wearer, but its primary purpose is to keep the respiratory droplets that we all expel when we laugh, cough, speak, or even breathe, okay, to keep those droplets close to the infected person. Because without that mask, those droplets are traveling a much greater distance and potentially have a much greater likelihood of being able to infect another person. So that's the whole point of wearing masks in, you know, cloth masks for the public, it's different when we're talking about healthcare providers and N95 masks and P100 masks mm -hmm. and all of that. I'm just talking about cloth masks sure, for sure. the general public and why it's so critical that people wear them. So are we any closer to knowing why some people are asymptomatic completely and why some people get this 
you know, full on and some get it not. I mean, I know we know about like conditions that can increase your chances of getting it worse, but do we, sure. are, do we are we any closer to understanding? I mean, I've seen theories out there about blood types and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I've seen the same stuff. So there are some that say that there's a relationship with blood type. There's some that say there's a relationship with race. There's some that say uh, we certainly know that those with certain health conditions are at greater risk, not of getting COVID, not just of getting COVID, but of having a very bad sure. uh, 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 illness from COVID, right? Um, you know, immune, yeah, one of the subjects that I really detested when I studied in medical school is immunology. And because, and one of the reasons why was because immunological reactions are very idiosyncratic, right? They're, they're, they're very variable depending on the person. And so I suspect that as more cases occur and our learning increases, you know, the more cases we have, the more we can divide up those cases in a way that helps us to identify what the true risks are, what, you know, what individuals are at greatest risk and, and of getting the disease altogether or at greatest risk of getting a severe consequence from the disease. Uh, and so that knowledge will continue to grow. I'll give you an example. Um, the CDC only four days ago, I'm looking at the calendar, four days ago, changed the list of, ind of conditions that it considers high risk. So in other words, um, they widened the net of those individuals that are considered high risk for a bad outcome from COVID. Um, they added some conditions to the list, most notably cancer, right? It wasn't, cancer wasn't on the list. Now there are, have enough people been sick and the data statisticians have been able to chop up the information and perform analysis sufficient that we can say with confidence that those with cancer and a history of having cancer are at higher risk for a negative outcome from COVID, right? That's something we didn't know because we didn't have the data. But as time goes on and there are more and more cases, a silver lining of more cases is that our learning improves. Mm -hmm. Learning about who's at risk, learning about what treatments are most effective, learning about what prevention measures uh, uh, are, are, are the ones that uh, have the greatest consequence in, in limiting illness and so on. So, you know, that information continues to grow and our understanding of COVID along with it. My final question, the final thing I want to talk about today is testing. And I, 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 we, we already talked a little bit about testing already, so maybe I want to move on to antibody tests. So we're doing the antibody tests. The first time that you and I met, you said, you know, they were completely inaccurate, about 50-50 chance. The last time we met, you said they're much better now. And so I assume they're even much better than that, so they're pretty good. You know, and actually Becca, my wife, for those of you watching that don't know who she is, she took an antibody test. She had... 0.25 she needed to get to 0.1 to for it to be positive so she was negative for the antibody test should people be going out and getting these especially like maybe before we see relatives or is are they good indicators if we have the antibodies or not yeah so there's nothing wrong with getting an antibody test and in terms of their accuracy they have gotten a whole lot better in being able to accurately detect whether or not an antibody, whether or not your immune system has been exposed to COVID-19 and whether or not you're, you've mounted an immune response and produced antibodies to COVID. Mm -hmm. If that knowledge is of comfort to you, then there's nothing wrong with getting an antibody test, but there's a huge caveat. And that caveat is, so what? <laughs> and what I mean by that is what we don't know is what it means when you have antibodies to COVID. We don't know if that protects you from getting COVID again. We don't know how long that protection might last. So while the test itself is a very reliable indicator of you've been exposed, you've uh, created antibodies to COVID-19 or not, right? What we can't tell you is the implications of what that means. Since you, we, we can't say, since you've had antibodies, you can't get COVID again, 
or since your body has a sufficient immune response, you're protected for 12 months from getting COVID-19. That final piece, that critical final piece, I think is the most important because other than, if we don't have that, then the, then the knowledge of whether or not you have antibodies is just kind of a data point, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess it's good to know that your immune system worked and it created antibodies, but it certainly shouldn't provide you with comfort in saying that, okay, I'm safe. All right, I don't, I can't get it again. I don't have to wear a mask. I'm, I, or I, you know, I can go out into the public yeah, it and eat work restaurants. Like that, like that. Well, yeah, and especially if, you know, as I said earlier, we've gotten some very disconcerting news about immunity. Again, these are anecdotal cases and sure. they can't be extrapolated, but the very fact that there are some folks that we know have been positive, that we know have had a robust immune response, and we also know have gotten COVID-19 again, that doesn't mean that it'll happen to everybody, but that does raise concerns about what it means to be immune to COVID, yeah. about what it means to have created antibodies for COVID-19. That we don't know. So, you know, what do I think about antibody testing? There's nothing wrong with it. And like I said, if, you know, everyone is desperate for knowledge and information. And so if it would, if ultimately it would provide people with comfort to know if they've been exposed and if they've had an immune response, then I'm all for that. Provided that you also understand what the limitations of that knowledge are. And the biggest is that we don't know what it means to say that you have antibodies. We know that you have them. We don't know what the implications are for you're getting sick again, for how long your protection might last if you do have protection. And so as long as you understand that it's not the sort of, you know, green light passport that we had once envisioned of, hey, I'm protected. I can't get sick again. <laughs> sure. uh, th we're not there, unfortunately. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's that's all my questions for today. You know, you've really shed a light on a lot of big topics, especially I think the school thing is the big one that's just on a, everyone's mind right now. They want to know what they should be doing. And I think the advice you gave is very sound and, you, you know, helped me even think about what we're considering doing, probably pushed us in a direction. So thank you very much. Good. I'm, I'm super pleased to do these. I know that this is our third and we're on sort of a track to do them monthly. I think particularly given the nature of this ever evolving situation and new information becoming available all the time, um, I'm happy to continue doing it for as long as it's valuable because we will continue to learn more. Yeah. And I'm happy to share that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for meeting.